Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. I'm Shanali Basak. I'm global finance correspondent for Bloomberg Television. With me, I have David Breach, who is the Vista Equity Partners president and chief operating officer. I have Jason Brady, who is the president and CEO of Thornburg Investments, and Jonathan Tetra who is Segard Managing Partner. Together, these three men manage, oversee, help allocate about $250 billion in capital across public and private investments separately. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, I think I'm going to start with you, Jason, because if you look at the, the market, and we're going to talk about the near term and the long term uh, over the course of this next hour. If you look at the market, the last two weeks, you had an S&P that essentially rallied. You're still down about 20% on the year, but you did have some green on the screens there. Was it a head fake? What was fascinating about that especially was uh, as we were at Thornburg were looking at earnings come in, they were maybe a little bit more challenged than the market thought or thought they would be, especially in the context of what really has been certainly uh, some of the leaders in the market over the course of not just not really the last year, but certainly over the last decade or so. So um, I don't know if you all are Seinfeld fans, uh, but we were called the, uh, the, the episodes in Seinfeld when George Costanza realizes that if he does the opposite of everything he thinks is right, <laughs> then he'll do great. And uh, yesterday felt a little bit like that. It was the opposite of what you thought, given earnings, um, and really got to the point where sentiment was just so terribly negative that there's just a fewer people to sell. Um, the CPI data, for example, was another example of that, where everybody thought CPI would be terrible, and then it was terrible. It was kind of like, well, there's no news here. So uh, we do think it's a bit of a head fake um, for, for us economically in the medium term. Uh, there's uh, more slowdown to come. Uh, I was had an a occasion to have a breakfast this morning where there was a lot of talk of slower economic growth going forward. So that's really going to be a headwind for markets uh, over the next year, year and a half. I wanted to start with that because this is such a, a intense week alone in the markets. You had Euro area inflation this morning coming in hotter than expected. You had the Fed meeting later this week. You have jobs data later this week as well. Jonathan, all this to say, you know, how do you think about investing for the long term when there is so much noise every day in the market? Yeah, I, I, I think you mentioned it. For us at the moment, uh, it's noise. Quite frankly, you know, from one week to another, very difficult to have a clear view about, you know, where markets are going. And, you know, we can talk about inflation and uh, energy prices soaring in Europe and um, you know, rates and looking at, you know, FX volatility and supply chain. And there's a long, long list of drivers that may have like profound impact on the economy in the long run. At, at the moment, you know, when we step back for us, you put it all together. And it's probably the first time if you look at past decade, there's so much uncertainty when you bring it all together. Um, you know, we believe as a firm at the moment, you know, we keep saying we don't know what we don't know. So we're not we're not trying to position portfolios. We're not trying to adjust. I think like, you know, most of our peers, we're, we're trying to step back and really understand when we look at the markets where we can play offense versus where we can play defense as a firm, but also within our portfolio companies. Some of, you know, our firms are very well positioned for this uncertainty and, and volatility and others less so. So, you know, we're, we're trying to, I would say, look 12 months ahead, you know, no crystal ball at the moment, but, you know, we believe that there's going to be more troubles, quite frankly, before um, going back to a more stable and less volatile environment. With all that said, David, I'm wondering for you, when you're looking at your portfolio, where does the data matter the most, both in terms of the companies you already own, as well as the future investments you might make? Sure. Um, I mean, we invest in uh, business to business software. So one of the uh, most important leading indicators of the future are software bookings, right? Sales today for deployments uh, tomorrow. So most of our companies, they go into a year and most of their revenue is booked for that year. So w while we're certainly very focused on today's results, uh, we're all we're very keenly focused on the bookings because that's really going to be you know what we're going to see next year. And, uh, you know, we currently we own 85 companies, about 24 billion of global revenue. And, and it's really a mixed bag. We're, we're seeing some of our companies that are starting to see some booking slowdowns, uh, you know, kind of through the mid part of the year. It was we were not seeing that. I'd say Q3, we're starting to see a little bit of the macro uh, headwinds affect certain of our companies. And then other companies are actually seeing 
uh, growth. Um, I think 85% of our companies uh, have hit their plan through Q3. And I think in certain cases, we sell productivity tools. And so in a, in, a, in a world where there's uncertainty, where you're trying to fight inflation, which is obviously on everybody's mind, a lot of what our companies sell help companies deal with inflation. So we're seeing in certain cases the adoption of more software in an uncertain market. But, uh, but I would say fundamentally, you know, bookings. And I think when you, if you look at the public companies that are reporting, everyone is very deeply focused on obviously go forward guidance, which is really a derivative of their bookings performance. I'm going to ask you, Jason, to double down on kind of the corporate read through in just a second. But David, you know, you mentioned 85 percent of your company is kind of in a better position here. That means, you know, 15 percent are not. But what does that mean in terms of you know, what kinds of companies make it through the next couple of months in a stronger position? Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, in our businesses, most of our businesses are running like an 85 percent gross margin. And so if you look at their net profitability, it's really a function of how they're investing for growth, whether it's in product development or whether it's in sales and marketing. And so what we're really calibrating with our companies is in light of the current macro headwind, how should you be investing for growth or not? You know, should you be pulling back some of the expenses that you were otherwise planning to do? So we have a pretty rigorous annual uh, operating plan process that um, as we kind of got into the macro headwinds of this year we had every one of our companies revisit it to say okay the assumptions you had about growth going into the year are they still valid or not and if not how are we going to change uh investing in growth and so that's um you know uh we've got businesses that just have a lot of free cash flow so we're not we're not fundamentally worried about the viability of any of our companies uh but we're we are fundamentally focused on are you investing dollars effectively and are there better uses for those dollars in light of uh, you know the environment that you happen to be in? Definitely talk about more of those assumptions, Jason. When you look at kind of the, the read through across public markets now, you know what is the uh, what is the forward planning here? Given what you said about earnings being weaker in some areas than you expected, the market's still responding well, meaning capital can still be flowing to them potentially should things not get much worse. Well, what's fascinating is to listen to David talk about uh, software companies with extreme levels of cash flow, which obviously is certainly relevant to his business model. Um, what we've seen over the last uh, several years is actually public markets have been a place where companies without much free cash flow have been able to fund themselves. And I think that has been a real an interesting switch, um, uh, part, of, part of the phenomenon of, of companies staying private longer, but also part of the phenomenon of of public markets really reacting quite strongly to levels of liquidity that uh, really are driving lots of prices. So as we look forward, uh, the real question will be the levels of free cash flow. The real question will be sustainability of business models. And you know, for us, there are plenty of companies out there, both again on the equity and on the debt side, with great free cash flow, good models, and frankly, a lot cheaper uh, a lot cheaper to buy than they were six, 12 months ago. Um, that's a tremendous opportunity. On the flip side, there are a number of companies that have funded themselves on hopes and dreams. And what this environment is, both from a slowdown economically, which we talk about, but also from a sort of higher cost of money, which is also very much in the news this week, it's really about going from uh, the revenue part of the income statement to the to the net income part of the income statement, or more importantly, actually to the balance sheet, and that's essentially the progression that we've seen in the last twelve months, and that is really going to serve either corporate corporates planning or investors investing very well. Uh, it's interesting. Before this panel, we were joking. We have a lot of non traditional backgrounds on this panel. It seems like that will serve you guys very well <laughs> in this new paradigm. We have a lawyer and we have a corporate consultant also. Jonathan, you know, when you're looking across your portfolio and you're having conversations about what the bottom line looks like for your portfolio, what are the tough conversations you have to have right now in terms of any major changes yeah. some of those companies need to make? It, it, very, uh, it varies a lot according to the different asset classes we invest in. We do private equity, we do VC, we do credit and real estate. So I would say in VC, it's all about making sure that you know, our best performing companies have sufficient runway to go through this. And frankly, having the ability to, to double down on the winners. Um, you know, um, many companies have been raising at very high valuations over, over the last few years. 
and you look at the portfolio of VC today and this moment where you will see, personally, I believe those were real long-term VC investors having the ability to build a proper portfolio. Think about, you know, reserving capital to support this portfolio and having the right network of GPs to keep this company growing and bring them to cash flow positive. So on, on VC, I would say it's all about portfolio composition. Um, if you have been deploying a lot in the past few years, chances are you might be in a situation where your portfolio will suffer. If you have been fundraising a lot in the last few years and you're deploying the coming years, you might have very, very good advantages. Private equity, it depends if you play in large cap, mid cap, I think you see multiple uh, being compressed on the large cap. And I think same thing. I think it's all going to be about portfolio composition. I think if you've been playing in small cap or mid cap, we've not seen, you know, real compression at the moment of the multiples. And I think it's all about asset selection and having the right team in place with the right business model, the right balance sheet to go through, you know, these next six, 12, 18, 24 months. We don't know, but again, very lots of focus on cash preservation. And if you do private credit, uh, it's all about underwriting. You know, we've, uh, we've been able on our end to raise a lot of capital, start deploying. And I would say the bar is very high these days. We believe it's a great moment because a lot of deals flow on private markets. Uh, to support uh, companies from a credit standpoint, everyone is rethinking about restructuring his balance sheet, and uh, but the underwriting is going to be uh, is going to be, you know, very challenging and very demanding um, in order to be well positioned to navigate the next 12, 18 months. So the first part of this conversation was really about navigating uncertainty, but I'm going to ask all three of you now to also talk about what the potential worst case scenarios are. There's a lot of worries about a recession, whether it's in Europe or the United States. How are you underwriting that potential, David? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, every one of our underwriting cases uh, that uh, in terms of any new transactions we're doing are assuming a recession. And I don't think any of us are smart enough to know uh, how long it's going to, you know, I mean, you can listen to a lot of pundits and experts and you'll get, you know, you can talk to 10 and you'll get 10 answers and one of them will likely be right. But, um, but we are fundamentally underwriting to a relatively severe downturn uh, and wanting to make sure that we can still make the returns that our investors expect if that happens. If it doesn't happen, then, you know, God bless. Well, you know, that's our upside case. But I think, I think right now you have to assume uh, things are going to get worse. Uh, and I think it's just prudent to assume that the that the downturn is going to be relatively, uh, you know, relatively severe. And it's again, you'd rather as an underwriter, you'd rather be surprised to the upside than the downside. And I think, you know, people have got to be really sober and realistic about, OK, how bad can it look? And are we, uh, you know, factoring in the right underwriting? What does a severe recession mean in your view? Yeah, it's numbers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, again, I'm not an economist. Um, no, but I, th I think, again, for our businesses, we're, we're generally buying businesses that have a particular growth trajectory. So for us, when we're underwriting, what does what does a, quote, severe recession look like? You're significantly s scaling back growth. Uh, you're significantly scaling back bookings growth. And, and so you're looking at, um, you know, when, you know, most of the companies that, that we want to buy have very uh, compelling value propositions to their customers, but you may see customers delaying some of those expenditures. So we're really moving out all the growth assumptions a number of years. We're cutting back short-term growth significantly, which obviously has an impact on free cash flow. Uh, you've obviously got to assume uh, most of the transactions we do have some component of debt. So you've got to think about what are your assumptions around cost of capital. And uh, again, um, you know, I'd say ramp those up because whatever you're spending on interest, you're not spending on, you know, the underlying core business. So, so I would say we're significantly cutting back growth and we're uh, significantly increasing the cost of capital in our underwriting cases. Jason, what does a recession mean in your view and how do you prepare for it as a money manager? Well, uh, the best definition I've heard of recession is, is when, when your neighbor loses their job and severe recession or depression is when you lose yours. Um, when we think about uh, recession, it's really about employment and uh, what we've seen, what we have in this country and actually generally globally is actually very low levels of unemployment today. Um, you're starting to see business confidence decline. Um, you're seeing uh, PMIs, global PMIs, which I think are maybe the biggest combination of biggest and best forward-looking indicators 
um, generally go below 50. Uh, in the United States, that, that will be reported tomorrow. Um, it, it just looks a little bit tough. For a little bit of a window from a corporate standpoint of what that looks like, I'm watching my industry, the asset management industry. And um, because of declines in market prices, you know, this is the worst bond market arguably in history. Uh, you're seeing the public comps report uh, operating income third quarter of 22 versus third quarter of 21 down anywhere between 30 and 50 percent. Um, so if the market is forward looking, perhaps asset managers are also in some ways forward looking in the context of incorporating those prices into their to their business today. And it's uh, it's a it's a real it's a real decline. So, look, does that mean that the world's coming to an end? No, asset management industry is famously volatile in the context of revenues, uh, et cetera. Does that mean that um, you know if you're going to lose your job? Well, I think uh, probably we're going to get to levels of unemployment that are maybe five or six percent, uh, but that's well above where I think generally the market is prepared to see things go. How do you think about the issues at play over the next year? How deep can a recession get? What does it mean for employment, especially across the portfolio companies that you own? So for us, we have, uh, I would say, different macroeconomic scenarios, but they are very different at the moment for North America and Europe. Uh, we believe Europe are gonna be, uh, is going to be facing uh, deeper and longer economic challenges. Uh, when we look at the situation with energy prices, I'm not talking about the short term, I'm talking about the long term. Uh, we're talking about tens and tens of billions of dollars of additional infrastructure required to increase the level of independence, not being totally independent. We're talking about significant spend to come in uh, uh, military expenses and, and defense. We're talking about you know, fundamental reforms that are not taking place in the pension system. We're talking about very high public debt level in many countries, in Italy, in the UK, in France, and so on. So we see like a we see a longer uh, period of of I would say uh, challenges in in Europe. Although we are investing in Europe, so it, we're we're still we're still deploying capital there. But we believe that the situation will be different in North America, but in North America, for the reason you mentioned, uh, we're going to be going through an economic slowdown. But when we look at the different scenarios we're, we're working with, those for North America are uh, much more um, bullish. Um, and you know what we do is we're asking our all our companies to do uh, recession assessments and look at you know what could happen under different scenarios from a balance sheet standpoint from a PL standpoint and starting to think about as I mentioned those who can play offense because we believe there's going to be lots of opportunities in fact there are opportunities at the moment in the market versus those who should be playing a little more defense and what does it mean for them and what we're seeing with our portfolios we believe. The companies that are best positioned uh, tend to be a little more risk averse, and then those that we believe are not as well positioned tend to be a little more risk taker. Which we believe psychologically is very interesting to see how the management teams are are reacting to uh, to these challenges. Maybe you can double down on that idea of where the opportunity is, because especially in Europe, we are definitely seeing certain alternative asset managers deploy billions of dollars at a time, whether it's in debt markets, some of the riskiest, given some of the challenges that structural, uh, structural challenges some of the pension schemes have faced. Uh, where can you lo logically buy right now, given all of that uncertainty? It, it really depends where the, the, these firms are investing in terms of asset classes. And I'll, I'll take you know two examples. The firms that have been deploying in growth equity at very high valuation over the past three years, we know a number of them that at the moment are returning capital back to their investors. Okay, I'm not going to give names or comments, specific situations, but it's going to be very difficult for them, these firms just to be able to return, you know, their their fund. And you know, we're already hearing stories of, of funds going out, out of market. If you take on the opposite fund firms that have been raising vintages year over year over year, that they're able to have a true to cycle view, that they've been raising recently, and that they've a well established portfolio looking at you know the current macroeconomic environment. It's a very interesting. It's a very interesting time to deploy capital. Multiples are going down. Those who have access to capital and have access to credit to finance deal are, we believe, the players that are more sophisticated with deeper network that are going to be able to still get 
access to credit at you know under decent terms and conditions and and you know the way we see it is the cowboys have left uh, have left uh, have left town and you know you will have people will be there to build businesses over cycles that you know will keep deploying and will benefit from this market environment so for those of you who have been watching you know the private equity industry or the buyout industry it's been a very very tough year volumes have really meaningfully dropped off somehow you guys at Vista have been able to strike multi-billion dollar deals in this market, several of them. I'm wondering how you've made that possible. Is, there, uh, is this about valuation? Is it about more power when it comes to financing terms? What is it about what you guys have done that have made it easier than some others to do deals that large? Yeah, I mean, what's been interesting for us is um, our market has been very dynamic over the last three years. So if you look uh, in our space, in the enterprise software space, 20 and 21 in the public market saw some of the highest valuations in history, and uh, we largely did not participate. So if you looked at our last 20 deals before January of this year, 19 of those deals were private deals and uh, we were not buying public companies and taking them private because we just uh, couldn't justify the multiples and the valuations and we just couldn't make the math work and uh, and so we were very focused on how do we partner with founders of private businesses to do really interesting transactions and that you know that was able to work for us and we were able to you know find deals that met our underwriting criteria you know kind of flip ahead to this year the market is completely flipped so private companies have not reset their valuations the way the public markets have. And so we're actually having more difficulty finding private transactions to engage in at valuations that we think make sense. But we've looked at a number of really high quality public transactions where the multiples have reset by over 50 percent. Um, and uh, so we view the public markets as a super attractive place to buy. So we're control, we're control investors. So, uh, but we've, we've obviously announced several transactions this year and, and, you know, knock on wood, hopefully we'll announce a few more before, uh, before too long. But um, uh, we really view the public markets as a huge opportunity to buy right now. Uh, and that's really where um, our largest fund has been, uh, has been focused. You know, from a from a credit standpoint, obviously the credit markets have been tougher. The you know the broadly syndicated market is pretty broken right now, um, but at least in our space, there's been a proliferation of private debt providers uh, that are still open for business. Again, they they're going to underwrite, and and uh, I think it's not so much that we have some market power with lenders. We don't, but. Uh, but they see the kind of transactions that we're doing and they feel very good about them. And so we've been able to finance uh, some fairly large uh, transactions uh, of these take privates of public companies. So I think for the next six months, my guess would be we're going to continue to be active in this market until you know, things adjust again. Helps that they like software too. It, it, they all like <laughs> software nowadays. So Jason, maybe you can step back here. It, with all of this said, you're hearing two folks here saying that the opportunity to take things private is more possible kind of in this public market regime. You're a public market investor to a large degree. I know you're thinking about alternatives. What role do then alternatives play, especially as more large companies go private now? I think it's interesting, uh, David's comments around sort of public versus private and that and that dynamic. Um, in a lot of the markets we play in, those lines are not sort of very finely drawn. It sort of gets pretty gray. Um, but what's fascinating is the redrawing of valuation in respectively in each one, again, that David mentioned. Um, it is surprising to me, and I think, you know, via a news story I read on Bloomberg, surprising to the CIO of Harvard, uh, that in fact, a lot of the private uh, market valuations have not been reset. Um, and I would ask uh, the, those that are fiduciaries of client capital, uh, asset owners, uh, if you're paying a fee on something that hasn't been reset yet, is your fee too high? Uh, to the extent that you have strongly gener cash flow generative companies, then okay, that makes some sense. To the extent that you're marketing the model, maybe that makes less sense. So. You know, for me the and for us, the opportunities uh, that are available across markets are really due to the resetting of overall the cost of money. Uh, it is more expensive. Money is more expensive, period. 
And so the value of capital and the ability to deploy it becomes more important both on an asset by asset basis, but also across a number of different markets. I, I think this is a time of tremendous opportunity, but it's a time of tremendous opportunity because one, as I think all three of us are saying, um, there's not going to be a sort of smooth road ahead. And so navigating that's challenging. And two, it's a time of tremendous opportunity because we have seen a real reset in valuations to a point where now the forward-looking returns look good. But if you haven't reset those valuations yet, those forward-looking returns aren't good. In fact, it's extremely challenging. Would you like to weigh in, Jonathan? I mean, how do you think about this kind of lag between public and private, and when do those things start to come together? Yeah, there are two factors. One is psychology, and I think it's the pendulum swinging back, and it's going to come back like it's been for the last Always. 50 years. Always. There's, there's no way against this. I, I think the, uh, this, the second factor which is explaining this delay is the fact that uh, it's difficult to a certain extent to reprice some of these assets at the moment. I'll take it totally different asset classes now, uh, real estate. So if you are an investor in real estate at the moment in US and you do multi-residential or you do industrial, the market is frozen. So if you own private assets, there's one part of your valuation committee that will say, you know, we need to talk about the fact that rates are increasing and, and the cap rate have been changing and all this. You, you, we see pressure down on the asset and valuation. And you will have the other part of your committee that will say, hold on a second, it's about supply and demand. It's about, you know, ability to increase rates and have tenants. And, and you have these committees and all of them were on their own process and their own policy. And, and what you see at the moment is clear alignment that valuation should go down and will go down. Is it next quarter? Is it two quarters, two quarters? But, but no one is moving because there's not sufficient data. There's not enough trades in the market to justify that these assets will go down. So from a corporate finance standpoint, you can obviously make the point. On the flip side, the market is not telling you based on supply and demand and, and seeing transaction that the prices are going down. And, and for me, it's a question of time. It's, it's, a, it's a lag, it's a delay, it will happen. Uh, but, but I think this is what you were seeing. It's been the same, same thing. You know, the, if you look at what was happening last spring, NASDAQ was like, you know, going down the cliff like week after week after week after week. And it took two quarters for VC firms working with the LP to agree on valuations of portfolio. And some people kept trading because of the abundance of capital and pressure to deploy capital for at least two more quarters at valuation like we're seeing last year. And we're looking at this on our and say, what is going on? Like the market is telling you that this period is over, but people that with capital, with pressure to deploy, were just like maintaining this artificial flying wheel. And of course now, you know, people are looking back and taking massive write off, but it took two quarters. And I think we're not out of it. So I want to take a large step back for a moment here, because what we are facing, and thank you all for so clearly delineating all of the challenges are higher interest rates. And this is a paradigm shift after more than a decade, a significant generational shift in, in rates. And you're also seeing this near term volatility in markets. You're seeing growth potentially challenged for years. And so what does this mean in terms of how you enter the next decade? Do you have to make a fundamental shift in the way you think about how you invest, given kind of this new environment that we're in? David. Uh, I guess I would start off by saying, uh, you know, what is your underlying investment thesis and how are you making money? Right. So, you know, we fundamentally focus on operational excellence as our big value driver. So we don't do a ton of financial engineering. We don't think we're smarter than everyone else. We fundamentally, we try and buy very good quality companies uh, with very uh, strong products in their markets. And then we, we work with management to operate better. And better can mean a whole bunch of different things. It can mean more efficient. It can mean accelerating your top line growth. It can mean how you approach your, your whole talent process. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of feel like the last 10 years, it's been kind of easy to make money, right? You've had free money, you've had, uh, you know, the Fed, you know, pumping the economy. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have been able to make money just by showing up, 
And I think the next, you know, I don't know if it's going to be a decade or five years, but I think this next period that we're going into, you're going to have to kind of make money the old fashioned way, which is actually create value. So, you know, from our perspective, we don't approach it any differently because that's fundamentally how we underwrite. Um, I think you've, again, you've got to be more clear eyed in your assumptions and clear eyed in terms of what you think you can do with a company in this environment but you know we've been in a market for like one of the big challenges in technology has been the war for talent and you know we've approached it in a very systematic operational way to try and help our companies win the war for talent well in this environment the war for talent gets a little bit easier um you know i, I read a statistic this morning that the number of job openings for software engineers declined by 29 percent so uh in you know february march i would sit in boardrooms uh of our companies and all they wanted to talk about was the war for talent and how you know difficult it was to keep people uh how difficult it was to hire new people you're hearing a lot less of that so you know in these environments there's there's challenges but there's uh, there's opportunities and not just from a valuation standpoint but opportunities in terms of what you can do with these businesses so so i don't think that we're going to approach our underwriting any differently but i do think the assumptions underlying our underwriting have, have you know, obviously absolutely got to change. Uh, and again, I, I don't think in our industry, I don't think this is a 10 year issue because I think there's just a broad adoption of software globally uh, that maybe got accelerated in the pandemic and is, um, but I think that the, 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 the tailwinds to our industry are not fundamentally, you know, big data is not going away. AI is not going away. Machine learning is not going away. Internet, none of those things are going away because we're in a recession, but you've just got to be more focused on the, you know, the environment you're in. Jason, are there rules of the last 10 years now that you have to throw out the window because of the new paradigm we're entering? I think uh, maybe buy the dip is one that's starting to, starting to go out of the window. Um, I think... Uh, valuing a company based on revenue is probably something that's going out the window. Uh, I think that not having to pay attention to kind of un the underlying kind of fundamental economic uh, environment, uh, again, because the cost of money has been zero and, and certainly um, is still below the cost of inflation, although I expect that to change pretty quickly, but um, quickly expected the change over the next year or two. Um, that has really developed some challenging or weird incentives uh, in all markets, and in fact, in all kinds of behavior. So I think the, the paradigm of the last 10 years has been a very interesting one, but we will not now, as a society, as investors, be able to escape that inflation and all that leads uh, that, that comes from that, whether it's um, social challenges, whether it's, you know, obviously uh, the cost of money, will not be able to escape that that is now possible because we've seen it. We hadn't seen it for 40 years and now we've seen it. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. Uh, so I think that'll actually drive more behaviors, um, not dramatically, but more behaviors over the next decade than, than maybe we, we expect today because we're just learning this again. So uh, just elaborate on that for one, for one more moment. To the extent that you do see a paradigm shift, what is the most significant thing that investors are going to have to wrap their heads around in the next several years? Just that, that borrowing money uh, comes with a cost and a cost and a, and a real downside, uh, which is either you know, bankruptcy or, or significantly curtailing potential growth investment. So you know, when both personally and sort of societally, debt tends to pull forward spending right you borrow when you when you buy a house and you borrow to buy a house you do that because you don't want to save up uh all the money that it takes to buy the house and then buy it you want to buy it today and then pay that off over time so you're you know it's very simply not a bad thing you're pulling forward consumption i think we've pulled forward a lot of consumption um on a more corporate level than a personal level but on but on sort of all sides and that that's going to be um, a weight that stays with us, I think, globally for some time. And would argue a government level as well. The worst, or the most. Just, just to build on that, you know, I, I think if you step back, at least for us, there are three things that have changed fundamentally. Uh, and, and those we believe are there to stay for a while. One is dealing with inflation. Inflation is, unless you've been investing in emerging market, is, is something that most investors, most managers, 
didn't have to deal with. Like it was inflation was something in the textbook of college student. We never had to deal in the past 25 years with real inflation. That would impact your business model. The second thing is, is the end of free money. I think as, as you mentioned, I think we've been living in abundance of capital and money was you know, kind of free for, for more than a decade. And we've been historically living in a low rate environment, declining rate environment for most of the time, maybe between, except between 2015 and 17. But we've been living, we've not been thinking, you know, companies have not been thinking about how the significant increase in rates could impact their balance sheet. That's been for a while. And the third thing is supply chains. You know, we were taking for granted that supply chains would be fluid, efficient, forever and then suddenly we realized for a number of reasons geopolitics reasons but also other reasons related to uh, issues with infrastructures and transportations and so on that's that supply chains are not should not be taken for granted and when you put these three factors together you realize that for many businesses um of of traditional economy or or um software related economy and so on we believe that it might be changing the way you will value these businesses going forward and the way that management teams of the companies will have to uh, think about their business model going forward. You know, because you brought it up supply chain, that tends to bring up another big theme that's impacting markets that a lot of people have been questioning in this globalization. Do you think that it is a threat? Do you think that globalization is facing a great rewind or do you think that there's still a lot of opportunity for it given uh, all of the international opportunities you're finding to invest? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's the end of it, but, but for sure, again, we're seeing the pendulum swinging back. Uh, and then personal opinion, I, I think to a certain extent for good reasons, to a certain extent for bad reasons. Now, we'll, where the pendulum will, will, will stop uh, will, will depend, I think, on political agendas of, of a few countries. Uh, it, is, uh, it is probably not, from an investment standpoint, something that uh, we see as, as very positive, uh, but something we have to deal with. Um, so if, if you ask me if the world's going to be more or less global over the next three to five years, there's no doubt in my mind it's going to be less global. You know, the, the flow of capital is not going to be what it used to be. The flow of stocks is not going to be what it used to be. I think it's going to be increasingly difficult to do business in certain parts of the world. I think we're going to see, uh, you know, tax barrier going up. I think we're going to see regula regulation framework being changed again to be less open and less friendly to international investments. Um, so in, in my mind, this is the direction it's going to go. And again, I, I think, I think it's going to be a political decision or political decisions from, you know, a, a few countries, quite frankly, it's, it's, you don't need too many countries to have a point of view on these things. It's a few countries that will dictate, you know, where the pendulum will, will stop. Now, each of you had kind of mentioned the challenge associated with inflation. I'm wondering if you look at kind of the assumptions that are out there across the market, if something is being miscounted almost, if it, it, everything you're saying about globalization and supply chains, many would argue that all of those have inflationary impacts to them. And so, you know, as we kind of look forward to, you know, the global fight to control inflation, do you think that there's something stickier about it than meets the eye? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think there's um, obviously the Fed tends to look at a lot of uh you know, kind of trails in the sand as opposed to, you know, kind of what's happening today and what people's expectations are. Um, so I think there's one element of it that, um, you know, again, in our industry, we're seeing softening, right? We're seeing, uh, you know, the, the biggest uh, cost input in all of our businesses is people. And uh, so we're seeing, uh, we've, uh, you know, a softening in the labor market, uh, a little bit less competition, which is obviously... Uh, it helps from an inflationary standpoint. Um, so I, I think those are the things that are not being picked up in the data quite yet that I think we will start to see over the next couple of quarters. So I actually do, I mean, a lot of folks that I talk to, I mean, people are seeing, you know, softening, slowdowns, labor market coming down. But, you know, I, I think until we really see a movement in the unemployment rate, I think people are still going to just psychologically feel like we are in, uh, you know, we're in a, a very tight environment. And, and I think we are going to start to see that unemployment rate move over the next couple of quarters. Uh, 
and and I it'll be interesting to see if that's the data that the Fed needs to see for them to start to uh, to pull back a little bit. And does that even fix inflation to the target levels, Jason? Uh, I it's a major input. So I, I appreciate that sort of the the software engineer down twenty nine percent. So then then in a software a software engineer, there's only you know, three openings for every applicant yeah. as opposed to five or something. It's progress. Right, exactly. <laughs> so the, does it fix inflation? Um, I, I think the, in everyone's lived uh, experience, the answer will be more than actually in the data uh, with, some, with some element of lag. So it's worth thinking about how do we get that data and what goes into it. Um, one of the biggest components of that data is shelter. And the way that shelter is calculated is a little bit goofy, but but just to sort of give you a sense, the shelter, actual shelter costs that people are experiencing day to day, either home prices going up and down or rents going up and down, really takes about six to nine months to go into that inflation number. So if you think about what the Fed looks at and has a mandate for inflation, right, price stability and employment, uh, those are two of the most lagging indicators that are out there. And so the Fed is driving, I mean, the Fed was already driving with sort of looking a little bit in the rearview mirror. Now the Fed sort of turned around in the car. They're, they're looking absolutely behind, um, which leads them to be much more pro-cyclical versus anti-cyclical relative to their, their mandate. It's, it's a real uh, challenge, a policy challenge, uh, but one which they've only exacerbated themselves in the last couple of years. So Will it fix inflation? Yes, it will fix inflation. Will it fix it today? It will not. 10.7% um, in Europe, uh, which we got reported this morning, is, is breathtakingly high. Um, does the U.S. have that same problem? No, but yes. Uh, are wages rising? Yeah, but they're not rising as fast as inflation is. Uh, so, look, th this, is, um, this is a new and challenging problem for, for the globe. Um, the measurement challenges that we see, it's, there's, no, there's no conspiracy theory here. It just takes a sort of the way that the stuff is calculated takes a while. It's, it's going to be, it's going to feel bad uh, economically before the inflation figures really turn down significantly. I really appreciate each of you taking a different part of the inflation story because I'm going to give energy to Jonathan <laughs> at the okay. moment. Because how do you think about, uh, you know, the energy crisis in Europe and the pressures we're feeling here in the United States? in terms of what that means for what people really feel day to day and what that means for kind of the psychology of the economy. Yeah, so I, I think there are, you know, short-term challenges and long-term challenges in Europe. So if, if you look at the short-term challenges, if you're living in Germany today, your energy bill has been multiplied by four literally overnight. So if you think about the working class, um, thinking about the next few months, suddenly it starts to feel very different because it's it's coming at you know in the context of you know inflation on the rest of the portfolio it's thinking in the context of slowing down of the economy and they start thinking about you know what's it going to mean for the next three months six months how they're going to get out of there and 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 so on and you see the same thing by the wind friends and so on so there's a short-term impact on the population and of course, on the industries as well. So you're starting to have conversation about, you know, limiting the access to uh, energy for certain parts of the economy. You see this in particular in Germany, and it will have an impact on the industry of the country. I think if you take a longer term perspective on this, and and what some of companies we're talking to are talking about is. Number one, unclear how long the situation will last with Russia and Ukraine. Number two, one thing is very, very clear is going to take probably a decade if you need to rebuild infrastructure with NLG terminals and things like that to increase the level of independence, a level that would be acceptable. And three, it will have impact on ESG because now you're talking about reopening or you know maintaining nuclear central open for all. So they're, they're like much bigger question for the fundamental economic fabric of the country, social fabric of the country. And companies start to talk about you moving in other jurisdiction and putting capital projects in other part of the world because they say we don't see the end. It's not just related to what's going on in short term. It's a much more fundamental challenge. And as you know, if if I were in charge of, you know, if, if I were 
in politics or our minister in Germany or in other countries, think of Italy, Spain and all this, and I were hearing business leaders talking about shifting, you know, my capital projects in other countries and talking about the localization in the next decade, suddenly you say, well, we're, we have, you know, even bigger troubles ahead. So there's, for me, a big question mark on the long-term impact of these energy questions in Europe. Uh, before I let you all go, I think what I really want to know too, we've been talking a lot about this paradigm shift, short-term challenges. You guys have been known at Vista to be, you know, legendary software investors. But as we enter kind of this new environment, are there other areas you're considering? Uh, are there different types of companies that are more investable now that weren't as investable in the last 10 years? Yeah, so, so I don't think we're going to be doing anything other than software. Uh, we, uh, we have spent 22 years uh, focused on business-to-business -business software. Uh, you know, we've been fortunate that we've been in a, in a part of the economy that has uh, really grown to be the largest sec sector of the global economy. And it's, if you look at the projections, it's growing, you know, upper, uh, upper teens, low 20s for the foreseeable future. So, um, so I think as an industry, we don't, you know, we're proven to be pretty good at that, and that's what we're going to continue to do. So I don't see us getting into crypto or me, like some of the other things that other um, that folks, other folks are pursuing. I think we're going to stick to our knitting and uh, focus on what we know we're pretty good at and uh, where we've got a lot of operational expertise. That being said, um, there are so many sectors to play in the software industry. Obviously, you know, there's been a lot of attention on cybersecurity. Uh, that's not changing anytime soon. Um, uh, you know, there's been a real revolution in terms, I mean, when, when you look at what we fundamentally do is we help, you know, companies digitize relationships, right? And what you saw during the pandemic is people realizing whether it's their supply chain, whether it's with their customer base, whether it's with their employees, that some of the old ways of managing and interacting were just going to be inferior in this new world that we're in. And so you saw somewhat of an acceleration of consumption. So as we look forward, we're really keenly focused on what are the key relationships that need more digitization and how can we buy companies that are helping customers do that. So, you know, we've got a big area of focus around uh, digitization of customer relationships, uh, whether it's, you know, um, if you look at a lot of companies, the chief marketing officer has as big an IT budget as the, as the CTO or the CIO does. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. And so, so I'd say there are trends that we're seeing and, and, you know, we've been, uh, when we started investing 22 years ago, most software was on-premise software. You had to deploy it out to a thousand customers and it was in some respects, kind of a cumbersome operational business. Uh, with the advent of the public cloud and the move to a SaaS model, you've had all these next generation companies that have been created over the last decade that are doing amazing things. And they're able to scale their businesses at a much faster rate than you could 20 years ago. And so we're really excited uh, to look for these, uh, you know, disruptor might be a little bit of an overused term, but these disruptors in uh, in various industries and how can we uh, how can we help them are there areas that you're seeing digitization of the economy accelerate at a faster pace even in this environment so absolutely supply chain uh, absolutely customer relation you know I was I was uh, with one of our advisory board members a month ago and, and we were having a conversation about how people think about marketing and you know used to you know a lot of your marketing was kind of broad based you're kind of marketing to 100 people to get to the three that are actually going to buy nowadays with all the advent of digital technology you can literally you know target a specific message to a specific person when they're actually thinking about buying uh, and this is on the business that, like we don't do consumer software this is all business to business software but uh, you know those types of technologies and with the pro there's just so much data that has proliferated that you have uh, you have the ability to look at data at scale and really figure out where you need to target your message to the person when they want to buy uh, and that's super powerful and so those types of technologies are the things that we're uh, that we're very interested in because they're just such a significant ROI for our customers. Jason, are you a newfound crypto investor? <laughs> or, <laughs> where else could you be investing now that you would not have done before? Sure. So, um, first of all, my marketing department is my largest consumer of IT and data for sure. But uh, believe it or not, uh, more than more than investment. That's why you were laughing. Right. Yeah. So, and uh, no, not on crypto, but I will say. 
Look, I think in many businesses, maybe in every business, you make your reputation in bad times and you build your business in good times. So to the extent we're in a more challenging market, it's not because it's not a lack of opportunity for growth. It's just building the foundation for growth. So as I look at markets globally, and I take Thornburg's expertise in looking across silos, I mean, for Miami-Dade College, uh, a lot of in investor, talking to investors is a lot sometimes like getting the English department to talk to the finance department. They don't really seem to speak the same language. And um, when you're able to put that together, especially in more challenging market environments, you can really add value over time. So whether that's the public versus private divide getting I don't know, bridge, but just that gray area getting more and more gray, um, whether or not we continue to see globalization or not, or in fact, if we see balkanization, those will be uh, environments that investors, that asset owners will have to navigate. And then as an asset manager, uh, where those asset owners are my clients, um, they're going to need our expertise to put it all together. Uh, because the idea that expertise in various small silos is easy to put together is going away. You're going to need actually uh, to be able to think much more sort of multidimensionally to be able to handle the markets and, and the, in general, both the, the political, the economic, the social environment going forward. Jonathan, new areas for you, places you're going now that you have not gone before. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure there are new places. You know, I'm not sure we're going to see like new asset classes. I mean, to have an asset class, you need you need some kind of intrinsic value in something. You need depth. You need volume, and and you need a marketplace. I'm, I mean, we can talk about arts and wines and all those, but I'm not sure they are an asset class. I think for us, it's more about finding niches uh, where the degree of specialization, sophistication might be different. Um, if you look, I don't know, 25 years ago. The good VC firms were generalists, and over time they start to migrate with sub teams dedicated to sub sectors. And you look at the VC space today; you still have these firms performing very well, but but they're like almost like boutique series of boutique with, within a firm. And and you look VC space today; you have you know dedicated firms that are we're talking about yesterday sports tech, for example, or climate tech, and entertainment tech. And and we believe that it's going to be more about having the right level of expertise. Uh, in niches, but by the way, across asset classes, could be VC, could be grid, but we believe that you know you will need you know the next level granularity to find these niches and have the expertise to source deals on the right and trade value with with these companies. And this is what we're looking at, trying to find these niches around around the globe. Thank you all for your time for such a deep picture into the economy and your companies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.